What, what I, basically um, we've been looking at um, is a ways of reconciling the, um, the, what you might call the private qualities of suburbs. Um, having a house on the ground um, with a front door, um, a garden, somewhere close by to put a car, that still is necessary I believe, privacy, um, greenery, a sense of space, um, uh, an outlook from your house with, with what you might call communal um, characteristics which are more associated really with, um, with urban situations, um, access to um, employment, uh, to um, schools, uh, other facilities, health centres, retailing um, uh, and so on. Um, and and what, what, what our, our sort of quest really is to see whether those two um, characteristics, um, the, 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 the private advantages, can be reconciled with the characteristics that you associate more with higher densities. <laughs> um, so there you have, um, on the left, the, the private um, qualities of suburbia, on the right, the communal uh, advantages that, um, that we, we want to try and give people. And I'd, I'd go further than that and say that what we're really interested in is walkable communities, that, that you can get to the facilities on the right on foot, so you don't need to take your car. Um, and I suppose what I'm very interested in, but it's purely speculative for me at the moment, is whether walkable communities um, with um, local schools and so on, just the sort of lo sense of locality which this government doesn't understand, where post offices and small schools are very important, whether these walkable communities have certain social characteristics that are really valuable. Now, we, we came to a kind of conclusion, um, and I'm in a sense sort of jumping over a lot of speculation here, that um, these things may work, this reconciliation may work uh, at this kind of scale, about 5,000 dwellings, um, which bring at a density of 50 dwellings to the hectare, um, housing density of 50 dwellings to the hectare. Um, and I should just add that there's 13 hectares of communal facilities, so the density, the gross density is just a little bit less than 50 dwellings to the hectare. That, that this brings people within 10 minutes walk of, of, um, of uh, a centre with the kind of facilities which we show there. And actually if the centre was slightly linear, you'd probably get uh, 10,000 dwellings within um, reach of even more facilities, much more robust. And the 50 dwellings per hectare um, is a density that we know um, will produce uh, houses on the ground um, with front doors for families. Um, and um, something very interesting happens, which I'm, I'm going to go on to, which I'd like to talk about uh, later, is that if you, um, if you mix some non-family accommodation in, into this uh, at higher density, say flats at, um, say three or four storey flats at 150 dwellings a hectare, um, you can start to release uh, space for other uses, um, still at this average density of, of, of 50. Um, the, the, other, the other sort of subject that's running through this whole um, piece of work, the piece of investigation, is I'm very interested in something which I don't think the planning system on the whole understands at all, which is whether we can do away with, almost do away with the distinction between net and gross densities. Because what tends to happen in um, development generally uh, uh, is that the government policy, PPS3, encourages developers to reach higher densities with their housing development densities of, of say 50 dwellings per hectare. But actually, um, the gross densities that are being realized in new settlements are much, much lower because of all kinds of reasons which are worth investigating. We've just started looking at a, a kind of hypothetical n new settlement um, and we're taking some of the characteristics of one of the expansion areas of Milton Keynes, but it won't be actually that area. And we're we're, we've just started work on this. We're looking at the idea that we may be able to sustain the net density of 50 dwellings a hectare across the whole settlement, um, across, say, you know, 
200 hectares and still make a suburb which has lots of open space um, and is as walkable and so on. So that, that's kind of where I'm going at the moment. So we did a series of studies of housing layouts and, and there are all kinds of um, ways obviously of, of putting houses together just to test um, whether we could achieve um, uh, family housing in two stories, some three story um, uh, and, and at a range of densities. Um, so this one, this, this test layout, if you like, achieves, I think it's 50 dwellings per hectare. Um, this one achieves um, over 70. And then you perhaps move from suburbia to what some people are referring to as mid-urbia, where you, you, your housing starts to have characteristics that are not truly sub, suburban. Um, I don't... I, I think this is really important because it does seem to me that if we're looking for a kind of balance between the private advantages I've referred to and the shared advantages, it may be that we have to mix sub-urbia and mid-urbia together. Um, and it may be, for example, that um, if we're trying to achieve um, very, very um, pedestrian-oriented road systems, in family environments, which perhaps make very few distinctions between vehicular and walking space, we're still probably going to have to have some faster road systems to get people around, depending on the scale of the settlement. It could be that the um, that non-family housing is what you associate with the main road system, and of course there might be some real advantages there that, that non-family housing may be for the elderly, may be for people who haven't got haven't got cars and so on, maybe where the public transport is. Um, now, um, this is a kind of hypothesis about uh, the consequences of mixing non-family and family dwellings together. And this is really a really important um, kind of move that we're starting to investigate. So, so that, that's a graph and it shows you a proportion um, of the 5,000 dwellings um, at a density of um, 150 dwellings to the hectare. That's very modest, uh, sort of low-rise flats. And that's 1,500 non-family dwellings out of the total of 5,000. Now, this is where it gets rather surprising, I think, actually. That that, that um, 1,500 dwellings uh, actually only takes up 10% of the development area whereas the housing is still taking up, um, whatever, 70%, the family housing, that is. You get something really surprising, which is that you've released 20% um, of the land take. Now, I just want to recap and emphasize. What we're talking about is a gross density of 50 dwellings per hectare. Uh, we're talking about suburbia. We're talking about a suburbia which has... 20% of the space available for other uses, of which, say, a high proportion is, is, is parkland, is squares, is um, recreational space, is forest, is water, is ecologically highly diverse. Um, so there's a kind of, quite a surprise here, I think. And suppose uh, one was to increase the non family accommodation to 50% and, and bearing in mind demographically I think I'm right in saying the UK is now 51% um, uh, households that, are, that, that don't have children um, so this is perhaps quite a real, um, a real um, mix whether it's a, uh, a mix that should be in the suburbs is, is, a, is an interesting question really and out of that you get quite surprising um, uh, pie chart where um, you've, as a consequence of the apartments, the 50% of apartments, still at not at very high density, the, if the density of the apartments was higher and your developer was wanted to build towers, um, this would be even more dramatic actually. And you could argue, slightly paradoxically, that towers for non-family accommodation may be a very appropriate way of achieving suburbia 
Because what's happening here is, it, is the high density of the non-family housing is actually achieving, just statistically, um, this release of open space, uh, ecological diversity and so on. And this is being done at, at, with uh, non-family accommodation that's actually at quite a low density, 150 dwellings to the hectare. Uh, you, you, we all know that you could go up to 700 without much, much trouble, in which case the release of open space would be greater, as alternatively would be the release of private space, because what it could do is it could allow the family housing to have a lower uh, net density and have larger plots, still with a gross overall density um, of 50 dwellings per hectare. So, sort of playing around with this, um, the ha housing groups there, this, I'm intending to work with grids, not because I necessarily think they're the right thing to do, although actually, um, you know, 18th century town planners did operate with grids, and American development is generally in grids, but grids allow us to have a sort of quantitative handle of what we're doing. So we've got these groups of... I think these are 26 houses with 100% car parking uh, uh, on, in little car courts and more car parking out on the, on the streets. And the pink is the, um, are, the, are the flat blocks at 150 dwellings per hectare. So that, that's um, the, the land take um, of open space in the housing groups. And incidentally, in this particular pattern, that the groups of houses get some public space which they share for their kids. I mean, that's one possible way of doing things. Um, and then, um, the consequence of the high density um, flats is to release um, a proportion of public space. And so, in this um, drawing, uh, there's a large, um, quite, quite large, uh, more or less hectare park with a, a pond in the middle of it, whether that would be big enough and pr sufficiently protected to allow ducks or swans to, to um, live there, as it, the kind of question that we're, we're beginning to get very interested in. We're beginning to get very interested in the fact that the biodiversity of suburbia is much higher than agricultural land. And it's quite an interesting thing, actually. And um, just to look further at this, um, I'm trying to think what this. Yes, this, this is this is this is Barking Riverside actually, an actual development, and that's its current mix of of uh, dwelling types and fam and s the sizes of dwellings. They're all in apartments, and the density is about is it uh, sixty? No. Six, uh, yeah, nearly 70 dwellings per hectare. And the, the, there's a sort of assumption from a lot of developers that you, at that density, you're going to get flats. And you're not going to be able to have family housing, and the families that are in the development are going to be in flats. Well, that just needn't be true. This is the same density as you see. The mix is much more family-oriented, and the, the, um, the families are in either uh, uh, terrace houses, uh, muse houses, or, um, or, or, or maisonettes on the ground. Um, and there are all sorts of important implications to this, not least that the environment of family housing is arguably a much safer one, it's much more active because it's got front doors on the streets, um, and much more of the open space is in private use than public use, so the maintenance and management implications are entirely different, as housing associations know. <laughs> Um, and I think that's the conclusion. That's a, a home zone in a scheme we've been looking at, and we're, we're, we're getting very interested in um, um, in the, uh, the successful characteristics of streets. And just to finish, we're looking at the moment two very different scales. And again, this is research which is funded by an English partnership. We're looking at, on the one hand, a, a very large settlement pattern. Uh, based sort of hypothetically on an expansion of Milton Keynes. Um, and at the other scale, we're looking at a, at a 
uh, an actual site in the London Borough of Merton where the, the, the kind of quest is to see whether we can uh, reconcile these kind of densities with the qualities of an existing suburb, its greenery, its openness, its privacy, and various um, characteristics that are important uh, to the people that live there. So thank you very much.